Hey folks, in this short video we're going to look at an interesting and powerful matrix product which is not very widely known, called the box product. If you're excited by this, be sure to like and subscribe and all that crap, click the bell, honk the horn, whatever. First, we need to establish some notation. We write n with square brackets for the set of integers from 1 to n, and I just call this n. We write nk for the set of subsets of n of size k. For example, 3, 2 is the set of two element subsets of the set of numbers 1, 2, and 3, as seen here. nk has size n choose k, that is, the number of ways to choose k elements from n elements, which is given by this familiar formula. Note in particular n1 has size n, and nn has size 1. Each set mu in nk, being a set of integers, is ordered naturally. We use the subscript notation seen here to denote the elements of mu in order. The first element mu1, the second element mu2, and so on up to the kth element mu k. We order the set nk itself lexically, or lexicographically if you want to be fancy, like words in a dictionary. It's easier to understand this from an example rather than a formal definition. For example, in 3-2, the sets are ordered like this. The set consisting of 1 and 2 comes first, followed by the set consisting of 1 and 3, and finally the set consisting of 2 and 3. To determine the relative ordering of two sets, we start by comparing their first elements. The set with the smallest first element comes first. If the first elements are equal, then we compare the second elements to see which comes first, and so on. Hopefully you get the idea. Now let A be an n by n matrix. To keep things simple, we assume the entries of A come from a field of characteristic zero, like the real or complex numbers. For sets mu and nu in nk, the determinant of the k by k submatrix of A with rows indexed by the numbers in mu and columns indexed by the numbers in nu is called a minor of A of order k, denoted with vertical bars like this. I read this as det A mu nu. Note that every kth order minor of A is of this form for some mu and nu in nk. As an example, we compute a second order minor of a 3 by 3 matrix. Be sure to pause the video and make sure you fully understand this example. We've studied minors in prior videos, but in this video we go deeper. We start by collecting the minors into a matrix. The kth compound power of an n by n matrix A is the n choose k by n choose k matrix A to the k consisting of the kth order minors of A. For mu and nu in nk, the mu nuth entry of A to the k is the minor det A mu nu. A few comments about the terminology and notation are in order. First, you probably find it mysterious and suspicious that I'm calling this matrix a power. We'll see why that makes sense in a moment, so just relax yourself for the time being. Second, we put angle brackets around the exponent k in the compound power to distinguish it from an ordinary matrix power. Third, notice how we're using the elements of nk themselves to index the entries of the power. This is natural because the entries of the power are minors. Finally, we're using parentheses with subscript and superscript to denote an entry of a matrix, while we're using vertical bars with subscript and superscript to denote a minor of a matrix. We'll use these conventions throughout the rest of this video. As a simple example, notice that the first compound power of A is just A itself, because the 1 by 1 minors of A are just the entries of A. At the other extreme, the nth compound power of A is the 1 by 1 matrix whose single entry is the determinant of A. In particular, this means the determinant of A is just the trace of the nth compound power of A, a fact we'll make good use of later. Compound powers allow us to elegantly express many facts about matrices. Let's take a look. First, the rank of A is just the largest non-zero compound power of A. This follows from the determinantal characterization of rank which we covered in a prior video. Recall geometrically, if we view A as a linear transformation of a space, then intuitively the rank is the largest dimension of a volume A preserves in the space, in the sense of mapping to another volume of the same dimension and not lower dimension. This suggests that the kth compound power of A when viewed as a linear transformation itself, operates on k-dimensional volumes using A. This intuition is correct and can be made precise in exterior and geometric algebra, but we won't say more about that in this video. 
As another example, the Cauchy-Binet theorem has a strikingly beautiful expression in terms of compound powers. Recall this theorem tells us how to compute the minors of a product of two matrices in terms of the minors of those matrices. In the language of compound powers, the theorem just says that the kth compound power of a product is the product of the kth compound powers of the factors. Although we've stated this for two factors, it extends to any finite number of factors. This result is very powerful. It also shows us that the compound power operation behaves algebraically like an ordinary numerical power operation, hence the name. In fact, it behaves better than the ordinary matrix power operation, because matrix multiplication is not commutative. It follows immediately from this theorem and the prior theorem that the rank of a product is at most the rank of each factor, an important and useful fact that we note in passing. Given that the compound power behaves algebraically like a power, this raises a question. Is there a natural product operation, which we'll here denote by a box, on n by n matrices, such that the kth compound power of A is equal to A times itself, k times, under this operation? If so, what is the definition of the k-ary product of arbitrary n by n matrices A1 through AK? To figure this out, first recall from the Leibniz expansion of the determinant that the mu nuth entry of A to the k, which is just the mu nuth minor of A, is given by this formula. On the right-hand side here, SK denotes the set of permutations of the numbers 1 through k, and we're summing over all permutations sigma in SK. Minus 1 to the sigma denotes the sign of sigma, which is equal to plus 1 if sigma makes an even number of transpositions, and minus 1 if sigma makes an odd number of transpositions. In this formula, the row indices of A are being permuted while the column indices are held fixed but we can equally permute the column indices while keeping the row indices held fixed, which looks like this. Now, recall that we're trying to generalize this operation from a single matrix A to K matrices A1 through AK. One idea is to simply substitute the matrices A1 through AK into one of these sums in place of the A's, and take that as the definition of the k ary box product. We could do that, but it wouldn't make for a very nice product operation. For example, if we did that in the second sum, substituting a1 for the first occurrence of a, a2 for the second occurrence of a, and so on, then we'd only ever be looking at entries in row mu1 of a1, and row mu2 of a2, and so on. So the product defined that way wouldn't be symmetric in the matrices, which wouldn't be very nice. However, there is a symmetric form of the Leibniz expansion, which looks like this. Notice here both the row and column indices are being permuted. The price we pay for this symmetry is an even larger sum, which we must scale down by k factorial, but it works. It's worth pausing the video to prove this for yourself. We use this as the basis for a definition of a new product. The k ary box product of n by n matrices A1 through AK is the n choose k by n choose k matrix A1 box through AK, with entries given by this formula. Notice this is just like the symmetric Leibniz expansion for a minor, but with the k matrices A1 through AK in place of a single matrix A. By construction, the box product is symmetric, or commutative. That is, we can reorder the matrices A1 through AK any way we want, and we get the same box product. Also, by construction, the kth compound power of A is essentially just the box product of A with itself k times. We just need to account for a factorial factor which is a small price to pay for symmetry. Let's take the box product for a spin and see what it can do. First, we can prove a version of the binomial theorem for the box product using symmetry. For n by n matrices a and b, a plus b to the k is equal to the sum over p and q adding to k of a to the p box b to the q. On the right-hand side here, we're using shorthand notation, which expands like this. This formula is very powerful. As an application, if we take the trace on both sides of this formula with k equal to n, we obtain a formula for the determinant of the sum of two matrices. Recall from earlier that the determinant of a matrix is just the trace of its nth compound power, a fact which we're using here. Again, we're using shorthand notation on the right-hand side in order to make this formula as sexy as possible. And is this formula not dead sexy? I mean, come on. This thing should be printed on t-shirts and bumper stickers. Now, if we take b equal to minus lambda i in this formula, where i is the identity matrix, we obtain a formula for the characteristic polynomial of a. 
This formula tells us that the characteristic coefficients of a are, up to sign, just sums of the principal minors of a, that is, minors whose row and column indices are equal. In particular, the constant coefficient is just the determinant of a, and the second to leading coefficient is, up to sign, just the trace of a. For any matrices a and b, since the trace of a b to the k is easily seen to be equal to the trace of b a to the k, it follows that the products a b and b a have the same characteristic polynomial. So we see that the box product helps us get great insight into characteristic polynomials, which are extremely important in linear algebra. There are important relationships between the box product and the matrix product. cauchy binet is one of them, which we've already seen. Another is the classical Girard-Newton identity, which in our terminology provides a recursive relationship between the traces of the compound powers of A and involves the traces of the matrix powers of A. Taking A equal to the diagonal matrix with diagonal entries lambda 1 through lambda n, the traces have the values seen here, as you can easily verify. These are just elementary symmetric functions, which are the things Girard and Newton were actually thinking about in this connection. The group Vanstone identity is another beautiful result, showing that a matrix product of box products is just a sum of box products of matrix products. Notice this identity resembles the expansion of a permanent, the less famous sibling of the determinant. On the right-hand side here, we're permuting the A's, but we can equally permute the B's instead. Or we can symmetrically permute both the A's and B's if we want to add up even more terms. Taking all of the A's equal to each other, we get this simple identity. Similarly, taking all of the B's equal to each other, we get this simple identity. Finally, taking all of the A's equal and all of the B's equal, we get something familiar. That's just our old friend cauchy binet taken out of its French context. These identities, among others, help us convert problems involving the non-commutative matrix product into problems involving the commutative box product, which can often make them more tractable at least once you've developed and understood the machinery of the box product. Because many problems in linear algebra involve the matrix product, this can be a powerful technique. That's all for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Here are the references I used in making it. Thanks for watching.